I'm Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, the Faithful Witness. Today we'll be talking about Lesson 23 of our study, which covers the last chapter of the book of Revelation. Here at last, at long last, we reach the conclusion of our journey through the book of Revelation. Um, it might sound a little trite to say, but what a ride it's been. Um, I've certainly been, I know you're just watching these videos, I'm recording them, I've certainly been going along with it, through it with you. Um, the work to prep for and to comment on these videos uh, leads to things that had not previously occurred uh, and is a bunch of work, but it's a very enjoyable experience and glad to have done it. And I think probably we're all glad to be reaching the end as well. Because uh, it certainly has been a lot. Um, in this lesson, the key thing that we will get to, there are two points really of great significance. One, we will we saw the new Jerusalem come down uh, and some of what it's about in the previous lesson. Uh, here we wrap up the part about how it sanctifies all the world. Uh, what that is and how that works, which is very important. Uh, and then John has some closing remarks about his book uh, and his words and his work uh, that are worth looking at as well. Um, by way of intro to this lesson, I would mostly like to conclude key points for the whole book of Revelation. Um, if you were to take away just a few thoughts that you associated with what is what is the book of Revelation, right? What's it about? Uh, what's my takeaway? If somebody asked me, what's the book of Revelation about? Um, and I'm trying to summarize, and they don't want a two-hour answer. The key premise and main concept and idea of the book of Revelation is that prophecy has multiple components and facets across different points in time. And all of the prophecy in the Bible not only talks about events of the Old Testament and the New Testament, but also points toward um, events that are coming at the culmination and end of time. And that Christianity, what that tells us about Christianity and our place in it is that we still have things to do. Um, it's too often that we think, that we hear, we focus on Jesus and well, we should. But in doing so, it's very tempting to start to see him as an end point. Uh, as he did that and now we're in the world and this is just how the world is. And that attitude is one of apathy and complacency. Uh, that has a hold of modern Christianity uh, in every age that has been modern or before that. It has a hold of Christianity. Uh, we lose the urgency that our faith is intended to have uh, that is an essential element of our faith. Uh, we're going somewhere. It's coming at a time that we do not know, and the world as it is will cease to be and a new state of being and reality will come about, uh, either at the end of this life or at the end of time, or both, um, in most of our cases, actually. And what we do with this time determines how we personally enter into that end of time. But it doesn't, you can't, I was recently on an airplane, and the thing that I was thinking about is, once the plane takes off, there is one thing that is absolutely inevitable, and that is that the plane is going to land back on the ground. What's not inevitable, necessarily, is how that will come about. Uh, if everything goes as intended, it will be a nice smooth landing, uh, and everybody will make it nice and safely to the other side. Uh, and that's usually what happens, which is itself, if you think about it, incredible. That you know, you could want, you could hurl thousands and thousands of people up into the air traveling at supersonic speeds and get them back down safely. 
But the only thing you know for sure when the plane la launches is that it takes off, is that it's going to land. It's so true too with your life, right? You were born and you have, you have taken off. Uh, it is inevitable uh, that that ends. The manner of that end is not inevitable. It could be nice and smooth uh, with everybody on board, namely you, alive, uh, and happily moving into your next destination. Or it could be a fiery crash and you could burn. And those are the metaphors, the plain part isn't, but those are the metaphors used in the scriptures, right? Safe and alive on the other side in a new destination or burning fire. Uh, are the two ways that you can land now that you have taken off. Uh, the difference between a plane and the Christian life is that the majority of people, the vast majority of people who go up in planes come down safely and alive. The vast majority of people who take off into this life crash in flames. So we're going to a place the prophecy of the Old Testament and the New Testament, everything in the Bible isn't just pointing back. It's pointing forward, and we should read it that way. And we should live in a way that is in accord with the idea that we yet have a destination toward which we're going. And there is great urgency in how we live our lives now to bring about our place in it. We won't change what the destination is, right? You can't change by what you do what's going to happen to the world. You can change how you're involved in it, but not what happens. You might be able to change when it happens, uh, right? That's the mission of the church is to preach the gospel to all nations and to bring about that end of time. Uh, if we're doing our part, uh, we are affecting potentially the when but not the what. So prophecy points, tells us something important about the end of time. Uh, when we understand some glimmer of what that is, it ought to compel us uh, to some sense of urgency in how we live our lives now. Uh, and that's, that's it, right? Uh, and a lot of, I guess, as a side note, a lot of these things about Revelation to try to place any of these prophecies at a particular place in space and time are absurd uh, and really should not be listened to. Uh, will be my corollary kind of side point because that's not what prophecy is or how it works. Anyone who tries to do that is badly misunderstood prophecy. Um, and that, I guess, will lead me into the one other side point that is here in Revelation in a way that in a more profound way, I think, and clearer than we see anywhere else in the Bible, which is how the devil acts in our world. And that is a huge benefit for those of us trying to understand how to live Christian lives, to understand some of the working of the devil, right? To understand that he cannot compel you to do anything. You are free in Christ, your will is free, your choice is yours. Uh, and the devil, for all power that he has, cannot damn you. Uh, only you can do that. But he can lie to you, and he does. Um, and those lies can lead you to damn yourself uh, easily. So understand, there's a place we're going. We need to act with urgency to land the way we want to at that place. And seeing through the lies of the devil that have extended into our society, our world, our church, is the only way that we're going to get through that. Uh, it's kind of, those are, let's say those are our three key points. If we want to understand what this book is in a way that is relevant to how we live our lives, and to what I believe was intended by the author John and the author the Holy Spirit uh, as this vision was written down. In this city, there is life, which we talked about 
in the previous lesson. And we talked about, interestingly, the primary source of life in this city is this river and not the tree of life, though that also makes an appearance here. Huh? Um, so you have got from the very middle of the city, the throne, I, I'm assuming it's in the middle, from the throne of God in the city, um, you have flowing a river. Uh, there's an image of it uh, in the book, uh, a neat image of it in the book, uh, for in the chapter for this lesson uh, at the beginning, uh, showing the throne of God and the river. It's This is an image that comes also from the prophets and from the temple, right? And now it's from the throne of God instead of from the temple. The river flows on the in the prophetic image, it gets bigger and bigger the farther away it gets, right? And it goes out to all the nations. Uh, here, it's explicitly described uh, as the river of the water of life, right? This is from God comes forth these waters that we've already, we talked in the last lesson about connecting to baptism. Uh, to the rebirth that comes in baptism. Um, and next to and along that river grow trees of life. Uh, you had in the Old Testament, in Genesis, you had one tree of life that was cut off. Here we have on either side of the river, the tree of life. Um, it's one kind of tree, but now we have more than one tree uh, with its 12 fruits. Uh, as though this river is enough to support, in the garden, you had somehow enough things to support a tree of life. Uh, and now, in this new thing, it is abundant, right? Here's the river, which is more important, and that river is able to support more trees of life. Um, with, and they're yielding constantly fruit. Uh, so it's not just only the one-time fruit either. Um, life has changed, right? How life comes about has changed. Um, it, this takes note of what Jesus Christ did. Um, but it combined, there's a, this is how prophecy works and what the whole point of what Revelation is trying to tell us, right? You had an image of what life looks like in the beginning, right? In the, in the garden, you had the, this tree is what life looks like. Sin entered, humanity was exiled from the garden and no longer had access to the life that comes from that tree. Um, then Christ hanging from the new tree of life uh, on the cross. Uh, was pierced and water came forth instead and that water gave the life of Christ this new life that was more abundant than the life of the tree um, now here in the garden you have both uh, but the more potent more abundant life from Christ uh, is the thing that provides the life for the trees to grow to provide that as well. So life is restored in full here in this city and it's restored through what happens in the garden. But lest anyone think we're going back to the garden and we're just munching on fruit from those trees again, uh, the river now is primary, right? The changes Christ made to how we live persist. Um, the church, after all, is the thing in this world that goes into the next. Uh, and that sacramental, baptismal grace of life in Christ uh, is the entry into the church um, and is absolutely essential. So we see both uh, and we see the waters of the river have primacy. We've already covered and here are reiterating that bad things don't get into the city. Um, it is the presence of God. There aren't bad things anymore. 
but even if somehow there were, they couldn't get into this city. They couldn't exist in the presence of and of God. The new thing that logically follows from that idea, but that might not immediately leap to mind, in the Old Testament, there's this big deal that you cannot see the face of God and live. Um, in the New Testament, it's dealt with insofar as we can look at Jesus and live, but Jesus is still God hidden behind a veil of human flesh, right? So we can look at the human flesh that is Jesus Christ, but we don't see beyond to see God as God, right? We see God as man. Um, the rule would still hold if we saw God as God. Um, although once the life of Christ lives in us, uh, we can go into heaven in Christ uh, and live with God there. But even then, as we've talked about, we're in heaven in Christ, and Christ is in God the Father, and there's still that little bit of separation. Here, the idea that we see his face um, is the idea that that separation is gone, and anything that would this is like being back in the garden, right? When Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. But as we just set up with the river, it's like it, but it's not, right? It's much more and much better. And that the main difference is that river, right? It's that the grace of Christ is there with humanity. In the original garden, without that, one sin cut humanity off. Uh, and separated us from God. Um, with the life of Christ flowing out to humanity in this river, um, instead, or in addition, we're now in a place where what's found now uh, in this recreation and the city of God coming down to earth is no longer able to be lost. Uh, it is permanent and it is eternal. Um, and that river makes all the difference, right? Uh, I know it's just an image of a river, uh, but the difference is the grace of the life granted to humanity by Jesus Christ makes the difference between what was and what will be. Um, and we will see the face of God. And God's face is written on, or name is written on their foreheads. Um, we saw that before, right? There's your mark of entry into, right? It goes with the river, right? I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right? It goes with the, the waters of the river uh, to be signed and sealed with the name of God. And again, we see a repeated and important theme. There is no night or darkness. God will be their light and shall reign forever and ever. There are two meanings there, right? Um, there's one that, oh, it's not going to get dark, so you don't need a flashlight, which is, and if you don't, presumably, hopefully don't need to sleep because that would get a little old. Uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue because sleep is, it's sort of death. Um, we'll be, that's not the primary point of what's being said here, uh, of course, right? John, in his gospel, uh, the comparison of the imagery is relevant, uh, uses darkness and equates it with falsehood and lies. Um, and that's been the work of the devil, right? It casts the world into darkness, uh, the lies of the devil and keeps us from seeing God as he is, right? It obscures our vision because we have believed things that are not true. And Jesus Christ then is both the light and the truth and the way, but relevant to what I'm talking about right now, the light and the truth together, right? Because those one thing, right? The light dispels the darkness, allows you to see clearly God uh, by doing away with the lies. So here, twofold, not only is there not going to be darkness, um, 
as in the absence of light, but there is going to be, there isn't going to be darkness as in the corruption of truth uh, and the presence of lies. Um, we will know the truth um, and the truth will set them free, set us free. Moving on from this idea of light and truth by way of transition, John says these words, that being this book, are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And to behold, I am coming soon. Reiterating the point, there's a vision here that is the vision of the prophets that is telling to John and to us as Christians not what did take place in Christ, but what will take place still. And when we don't have the day or the hour, we do have soon, um, which is guaranteed to be true, right? I am coming soon. Whether all of this wraps up and we enter a new phase of the world in two months or in a million years, for you and for me, it's coming soon regardless. It comes in phases and it comes at the end of our lives as it comes at the end of time. Um, and what all you get, regardless of how long time extends, is till the end of your life. So for your purposes, the two are one and the same. Uh, and soon. So there's that. Uh, and that's the, by far the biggest point of this section. So blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book, mainly also being the words of the prophecy of all books. Because uh, the words of the prophet, there's not new prophecy in Revelation, uh, which is an interesting thing in its own light, right? It's, this is, this is, previous prophecy restated and reviewed. So it's the prophecy of this book, but it's the prophecy of every book in the Bible uh, herein contained. We see John wanting to worship an angel again, and once again being told to worship God instead, um, and to keep the words of the book. The emphasis here, the author is concluding his book, right? And the emphasis is, I didn't bother to write this down so you all could ignore it. I spent a lot of time, clearly a great deal of thought went into uh, what's in this book. Uh, we've talked about how it could be a vision and it could be a finely crafted uh, work of literature at the same time uh, as the vision could be a vision of those previous prophets, right? And of reading and studying uh, the previous scriptures. It could be guided, very easily be guided, directed by the Holy Spirit, be a new vision of previous prophecy, uh, new words that could have taken John a very long time on Papalus to craft, and not just he had a weird Sunday once and he wrote it all down, uh, as it casts itself a little bit. That seems unlikely, but it's possible. And you're free to believe that if you want. But either way, um, God spent a lot of effort showing to John uh, some very important things that then he took the time to write down. Uh, and despite how dissonant this book can seem on first glance to the rest of the scriptures, it has been ruled as, as something that is divinely inspired by God and should be included in the Bible. And hopefully, after going through all of these videos, you no longer have the idea that this is dissonant to the rest of the Bible, but that it actually follows very naturally and correctly as the thing that should be concluding um, our scriptures. Uh, I sure think that's true. Uh, but John goes to a lot of effort here to remind us, uh, hey, this is inspired by God, you really ought to follow it, uh, to keep the words of the book, not just to read it, but to do it uh, with great urgency. And don't seal it up or hide it away or ignore uh, what's here. 
um, because urgency, right? This matters a lot and the end is coming soon. Um, and every person's immortal fate is yet to be determined. And when Jesus comes, he comes with recompense. And here we see that same line, I am the Alpha and the Omega, that previously uh, was spoken by the Father on his throne, now spoken as well by the Son. Um, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Um, with a reminder, again, of some of those do right things and be blessed, or do bad things and be left on the outside or thrown into the lake of fire. I've, with further emphasis on you can come, you have an opportunity to listen, to, to obey, uh, to drink the water of life, and to live or to not, and to die. This penultimate bit makes a good deal of sense. Um, It's a warning not to add, remove, or change what's here in the book of Revelation. We see, oh, we see well-meaning pe ish people who don't understand at all what's going on here, trying to make it into things that it's not constantly. Imagine if they could change the words of the book to fit with their goofy interpretations. The interpretations themselves flirt with being contrary to this warning, uh, right? You're, because people are still attributing to thing to John in this book things that he and it do not say uh, a lot, and skipping over things that it does for something that is that doesn't have a narrative to be so tightly constructed, right? There's not a single like chronological narrative through the whole book, but it is, as hopefully we have all seen at this point, very carefully constructed. Removing some small pieces here or there or adding some could catastrophically alter the meaning of what's going on uh, and change the view. Uh, but so can ignoring or deliberately misconstruing for the sake of interpretation. I think practically for us, the warning here is more relevant to how we interpret and not what's written, uh, but both are true. And I can, I can see why John would feel the need to work that in, uh, having spent the effort that he did to get this to where it is. Uh, there's nothing that I've ever encountered that is similar to the book of Revelation. Uh, the the depth of insight uh, required to do this from the rest of the Bible um, is staggering. Insofar as I have no issue with him calling it a vision if it took him 20 years to write it. Um, this is not a human-only work. Uh, this is someone acting with the spirit of prophecy or surely as any of the prophets did even if not writing new prophecy you know it's, it's staggering what was achieved in this book um, and what it shows us um, and so I'm willing to more I'm more than happy to let him slide in a couple verses at the end warning damnation on anybody who might try to tamper with what he crafted so carefully um, and again, the practical side for us is not only tampering with the words, but tampering with the meanings. Um, so many people do find themselves well along the pathway to damnation from having misinterpreted this book in particular. You see it happen. Um, they get so lost. Um, and have such a wrong idea about very important things. Um, Hopefully, as we are at this point, by the grace of God, uh, in this book and in this study, we are not in that category. Uh, and we have some correct understanding of what's been laid out, at least enough to, I'm sure we've not understood all, 
I'm sure we've made mistakes. Uh, it's complicated enough. I think the broad strokes, however, uh, are correct. And the general call to live urgently and in love of God uh, is true and persists. Of course, we have also, this study also does have an imprimatur and is very rooted in church teaching. Uh, but of course, there are there are so many little interpretations that can be made that could be wrong without going against her teaching. Um, much has changed in the second edition of the, just as an example of how this happens, much has changed in the second edition of this book from the first. Uh, a lot of the words are the same. Um, the overall, and this is exactly what John's talking about, right? So many of the words between the two editions of the book are the same. There's nothing, I would be, I have no problem with anyone still reading the first edition of this book and studying it. There's nothing in it that I think, oh, this is horribly misleading and wrong. But the second edition has, with relatively minor changes considering, has vastly more depth than the first edition. Uh, that I think it would be very foolhardy of me, uh, of us, to take the view that this is the end-all, be-all, final uh, version of what all of this means. Uh, it's simply not. Um, so I appreciate everyone coming along with us for this journey. And I'll say, as I've said a couple times throughout these videos, but probably not enough, there's a lot in here that you're free to disagree with us about, as long as your interpretations stay true to church teaching. Um, and to the text, uh, you're free to disagree. Uh, this is a way that is consistent with church teaching and the rest of the scriptures uh, and throughout the book itself of understanding, making sense of what can be difficult, what is massively difficult to understand. Uh, it is probably the hardest bit of scripture to understand. Uh, hopefully, those of you who have come along with us through this journey have found things that are beneficial, um, not from a, the point of view of intellectual understanding. That's not really our goal. Uh, and great, it's, it's fun to understand better what the Bible is about, but it brings greater accountability as well. Hopefully, you've taken away things that have changed how you live your life. And you know if that's true? especially if you're not directly in one of our Bible studies and you're watching this anyway, we would love to hear about us or hear about that from you. Um, it doesn't really matter uh, that we, whether we know that this changed your life or not, but, um, you know, we would be thrilled to hear from you if you've had a good experience going along with this as well. And um, you can, on turningtogodsword.com, you can find a means to contact us if that's the thing you want to do. Uh, if you're in our studies, you've probably already told us, and we appreciate that as well, uh, but you can tell us in person. Uh, anyway, so interpretation of Revelation, hard thing. Don't add or don't remove, uh, and try to take away from this something that you can live with. If you are at all confused about the most important takeaway, here it is. Surely I am coming soon. Uh, we've emphasized urgency at great length, uh, especially throughout the second half of the study, uh, as the book did itself, as Revelation does. Uh, that is your number one takeaway. Surely I am coming soon. Uh, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Uh, I think John kind of sums that up better than we could without him. So surely I am coming soon. This has been an overview of the final lesson of the Turning to God's Word Bible study, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. For more information, consult our written study and visit us online at turningtogodsword.com.